Um, hi, everybody. I'm Mark Collins, and uh, I have the privilege and the honor to be not in the frame. <laughs> I'll be over here. Um, I am CTO of Voxio, and Voxio is a tiny startup. Um, we build chatbots that help people understand, navigate, and improve mental health. So it's a very, very small niche AI company. And it is a super interesting, very um, fulfilling, very rewarding project. Um, and that's not what I'm going to talk to you about, because what I want to talk to you about today is more about our journey on how we navigated the choices that were presented to us on our route to building what is essentially our service. So the choices around building the service, and these aren't just choices to a chatbot AI startup. These are the choices that will apply to all of the people in this room at some point or other in their innovation career. So in the old days, there was no choice how you did these things. It was pretty much the domain of experts, and if you wanted to do some AI, you brought in the AI expert, and uh, they performed some secret incantations and decoded the secret recipes in much the same way that a celebrity chef does. And that was how it was done, because there was no alternative. Um, and this whole arrangement is actually very, very fragile. It takes a lot of resources to actually get this to work. Um, assuming you can get the uh, expertise in. Um, and in the background there, I've got a little snippet of Python, and there's bonus points if anybody knows what that Python does. Um, if you can read it, that is, because it's kind of small. Um, but that Python is actually a sentiment intensity analyzer. That's all you need to run it. What's interesting about that is not what it does. That's not the, the crazy thing about it. What's crazy about it is that those few lines can be understood by anybody who is Python literate. Anybody in the world can read this, and once they've seen how the input relates to the output, the whole thing is understood. You don't need to know the AI. So although what it's actually doing under the hood, what the library is doing, is actually quite interesting. It's all to do with the statistical counts of the biases of these words towards particular emotional states, and given da 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 that's all very good. You need to know nothing about it to be able to use it. And so we've gone from having this scenario where you had an expert who was the sole gatekeeper, the domain uh, genius that ruled the thing, to being a scenario where any coder who can read the line of code and can load a library can use some pretty powerful stuff. And this is an example of a commoditized AI service. It's a very trivial example, and I use it here because it's very easy to explain what it does, and even if you're not from an NLU background, you'll appreciate what that does and why that's useful. But it's this utility, it's this fact that you can do this even though you don't know exactly what's going on under the hood and really don't care as long as you get the result that you want. So, in my opinion, Amazon's been the main driver of a lot of the commoditization of AI. A lot of the services that are out there are primarily Amazon-driven and they have this vast array of products. It's ever-increasing. I put up 150, it's probably more. Um, and some of the standouts for me of the services they provide I've listed here. So Comprehend, which is just a service that does text to meaning. And you don't think, well, OK, so what? You know, that doesn't sound all that hard. And then you realize what they can do it to. So it's capable of handling jargon, abstractions, abbreviations. It's capable of working on things like medical notes. Now, that's pretty impressive to anybody who's ever tried to work with medical data. Um, and it means you can ask questions which are structured. You can say, which patients received medication X in dosages greater than Y via this route over the past whatever time period? That's really powerful. That is really powerful. But what's really clever about it is that you don't have to invest all the money and the effort and the time to training it, to obtaining and cleaning the data. I mean, just gathering the data itself is a complete mission. Being able to build systems off the back of it, again, there's a lot of heavy lifting. You just simply bring it in, pay you a couple of dollars, get your result, and you are done. That is a game changer. Recognition does the same thing for pictures. You know those are you a robot captures 
where it says, identify all the cars in this picture. Yeah, that's not going to work so well so much. You know, language tools. Translate, transcribe, the poly tools. So speech to text, language to language, text to speech. You can round trip the language to language conversion, and it doesn't sync. That's pretty impressive. But more impressive is that Duolingo is using poly to generate their speech that they're using to train people how to learn foreign languages. So think about that. An AI is teaching humans how to speak. That's pretty cool. And it's not a difficult to obtain service that you had to cook up yourself. It's something which you can literally buy in as a commodity. And the last one on this, this list could be enormous and it could go on forever and it doesn't have to be Amazon, but it makes the point. The last one on this is personalize. And personalize takes a triple, so it takes, at, at minimum, it takes when, who, and what. And with that triple, it can make predictions about your user's behavior. Now obviously, the more data you pack into that, the better it will be. And if you're an expert in this, and you know what the systems are behind the scenes, then you can finesse and tune that, and you can get better results than anybody else could. And that's always going to be the case with all of these systems. But it raises the question, do you have to? Because everything's just going to keep getting better. Well, OK, so you can make an argument that Deep Lens wasn't awesome. But everything is going to get better. And there are other players here, too. Google's here, Microsoft's here. You know, IBM have been here for donkey's years. And that's not counting all the other people like NVIDIA who are pushing up from more of a grassroots kind of direction. And it's all heading in one way. It's heading for more powerful tools. So it's going to be faster to develop. It's lowering the, lowering the financial and competence thresholds to getting on board with all of these things. So a lower barrier to commoditize the AI is definitely coming. Which sounds great. That is, that's pretty cool, right? I mean, that's pretty much what everybody asked for. At least that was on my Christmas list. But where does this leave the AI sector? Where does that leave us as AI um, proponents, as AI companies? I am in an, a self-styled AI company. But what does that mean? What do we own? In the old days, it was easy. You had the only expert in the whole of the universe who did that thing, and they worked for your company, and thus barrier to entry was incredibly high. But that's not true. We can't claim to own the technical hurdle anymore. We just don't. We are using a lot of bought-in services and kind of reshuffling them to give a unique product. So what is it that an AI company owns? And we thought about this in Voxio, and we asked ourselves a lot of questions about what we wanted to be and what we wanted to own. And we looked at other people who were around us in our ecosystem. We're in Codebase, and there's a hell of a lot of AI startups in Codebase. And we were like, well, most of the people around us are some variant of, yeah, we use AWS throughout, but we're the only people that whatever, whatever, whatever. You know, facial recognition for cats. And yeah, that's, that's a little bit tongue in cheek. Uh, well, okay, it's tongue in cheek unless you're doing facial recognition for cats, in which case, more power to you. Um, and you let me know afterwards, I'll change the parody. Um, but it's only partially tongue in cheek because it makes the point that really you're not an AI company so much anymore, you're a content delivery company. And thus you are pretty much repackaging, reprocessing and niching yourself into a particular corner that you hope nobody else is going to move into. So, okay, so where does this leave us? Commoditized AI is here. It's here right now, it's coming in ever uh, cheaper and greater variety. And this leaves you in a different place depending on where you are in that ecosystem. So if you're based in expertise and you are the only company that does X, Y, Z and you're hoping that you can keep this somehow safe, then that's great. This probably isn't going to be as useful to you as it is to smaller startups like my own, which are trying to deliver scalable products to, uh, of certain types of services, which we would never be able to deliver without these commodity services. So the choices are very simple. I can either structure my company to use off-the-shelf services, create innovative products, and apply them to what I think is a unique area. That's my company. Or I can try to own a niche, try to defend it, try to retain some secret knowledge, and with a bit of luck, get away with it. And you know, there's all the costs and fragilities associated with that. So maybe I don't need any data scientists. Maybe I can do it without. So possibly, 
what I could do is I could take, well, I can definitely prove that I can make strong, scalable products using cloud services. That's without a shadow of doubt. So I can take my unique thing, whatever that is, I can drop it through some cloud services, I can gift wrap it, I can throw it to my users, and they will love it. Well, at least that's the theory. Or I can put on my AI running shoes, and I can try to outpace and outdistance Amazon, Google, Microsoft, and everybody else. And just try to stay ahead in the race. So those are the choices that we faced in Voxio. And we thought long and hard about it. And fairly obviously, we hedged our bet. We compromised. Because what we realized was we wanted to own our processes. We wanted to innovate our tech. But we also wanted to bring in tools and evaluate it to make sure that the people we were serving got the best value for their dollar. So we do a little mixture of the two. We settled on prototyping with off-the-shelf technologies. We do UX work in mocks and things in Flow. We use Messenger and Slack and everything else that we can interface to to prototype and test content. And we identified parts of the market that we think we can own. So places that we think we have an edge are in content and in NLG. And so, yeah, we use AWS incredibly heavily throughout, and we hope that we retain something which gives us a distinct edge. So those were the uh, experiences of us in a tiny little startup. I thank you for your time. I'd like to wish you the best, best of luck in whatever journey you're on, wherever you go, and whatever choices you make. And thank you very much for listening to my presentation. Thanks, Mark, very much. Thank you.